Hi, this is Latent Heat video part three, and I'm going to pick it back up from page four of section 7.1, Latent Heat. Um, after the second part of the video, you should have had a go at example two and three. If you haven't done so already, you should. Uh, pause the video now and actually go and have a go at it yourself. Um, I guess in terms of preparing for the exam, the total time limit for doing these two questions um, back to back, I would suggest probably about 15 to 20 minutes um, since it's your first go. So 10 minutes each um, will be a good um, indication of how fast you need to go in the exam if this was an exam question. Um, example two and three are both what I would call A standard questions. Um, and so I'm going to talk you through the solution. So I've already written up the solution here. So if you can put me on one side of your screen and on the other side, your solution, so at least you can see what steps you should have done. Alternatively, watch your video and then um, have a go at marking your own work. So first thing, solving all physics problems, um, is either draw a diagram if you need one, or write down the things that you're given in the problem. So this is a classic example of um, a really standard latent heat problem. I've got 50 grams of ice block at negative 5 degrees, and it's placed in 500 grams of water at 35 uh, degrees Celsius. Assuming this to be a closed system, what is the final temperature of the system itself? So I've written down um, all the things that are given to me in the problem, so you can see that in the pink writing. Um, I've also made sure that I have a clear indication of the units that the question has given the values in so that I know that I need to convert them into SI units or the metric system of units. So there is actually um, a built-in little troll feature here where all the masses of both the ice and the water is given in grams but they really need to be in kilograms. So I did the conversion already and I also wrote down what I needed to find with the question mark. The next thing that you should do is to do some thinking because most students would just try to go for what sort of equations are involved in this problem and just try to solve it. So at the, this moment in time, there are only, I guess, three equations that we've learned in the physics unit up until now. So let me write them up at the top of the page for you. We have learned power equals to energy divided by time. We've also learned that uh, Q equals to MC delta T, where we've got um, the specific heat capacity, which is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a pure substance by one degree. And just right now, I've introduced latent heat, which is Q equals ML. So basically, all of the problems can be solved by using just these three equations, but in various combinations. The most common mistake students make is just try to grab all the numbers that they're given and try to shove them into an equation without thinking about whether it makes sense or not. So I'm going to actually get you to think about it. If you haven't done that already, pause the video here and have a think. If you've had a think, you can have a look at what I, what you should be going on in your head. So I've kind of put this in orange. Due to the second law of thermodynamics, you should know that we, if it's a closed system, then the heat gained by one object is equal to the heat lost by another because obviously energy can't be created or destroyed. It's really just transferred. If it's a closed system, um, the amount of heat energy stays the same. It's just moved from one object to another. So if that's the case, then second law of thermodynamics says that they have to get to some sort of equilibrium temperature. So I'm going to assume that Tf is the equilibrium temperature or the final temperature by both the ice and the water. So it's kind of like a stepwise problem solving. That gets to my second little point, thinking that happens in your brain. Um, the second part of that is to realize that there are three parts. So what does the ice have to do? Well, the ice has to actually get up to zero degrees because it starts off down here at negative five. It has to get up to zero first. So that actually is a specific heat capacity problem. And then the second step is to realize that as it's at ice at zero degrees, it needs to actually warm up or go through latent heat of fusion to turn from ice that's at zero degrees to water at a zero degrees and then the third step is that the water now at zero degrees will now rise in temperature until it gets to the final temperature tf on the other side um, it would be the water that starts off at 35 degrees that slowly comes down and loses thermal energy or heat energy as it comes down from 35 to the final temperature tf the assumption is that step four, the water that starts at 35 degrees, 
losing heat is going to provide all that heat that's required to get the ice to warm up to zero, to turn from ice to water, to turn from really cold water at zero degrees up to some sort of equilibrium temperature. So they get to the same temperature on the Celsius scale. To solve the problem, it always starts like this. So we've started our specific capacity problems. Similarly, uh, the heat gained is equal to the heat lost. But for the gain on the left-hand side, I've included just the ice. So you notice that I've got MI, MI, and MI in terms of uh, variables on the left. And on the right, the only thing that loses heat energy is water. That's why MW and everything that's related to W is on the right hand side of that equation. Then I just pretty much substitute my numbers in. Um, so I don't think I need to go through the specific heat capacity components of the left hand side because you've done that um, previously in the last unit of work. But the actual um, latent heat capacity or ice turning into water is illustrated here and I'm just going to highlight that that is actually the new part yeah, that we covered today. Um, and then on the other side I've got my water that starts off at 35 and gets to uh, TF. Now I've got um, TF on either side of this, the larger number minus the smaller number. The rest of it is just maths. Um, I get to the final answer 24.38 3116 degrees. I've rounded to three significant figures because the question itself had a minimum of three significant figures. What do I mean by that and why can't I write the final answer as 24.4 um, is because um, if I go back to the top here, the number that has only three significant figures would be the negative 5.00 degrees or um, the 35.0 degrees. Um, those are all three significant figures. Remember that zero after a decimal place with numbers at the front is actually significant. Um, so there you go. Um, that's example two. Example three actually steps up a level. So if example two is what you call like level 20, like in gaming terms, then like question example three is like level 35. Um, it's tricky and I'm going to um, show you why because you've got um, steam that's at, you've got 20 grams of steam that's really, really hot at 100 degrees, but you've also got ice at zero degrees. Now, the temperature is important because you know that if steam and ice at those temperatures can very easily convert into the state of water at both of those temperatures but it requires energy so this is tricky because the first thing you need to work out is well what if all the steam it, uh, is condensing and there's energy that's released from that so as it comes down energy is lost or released and all that energy obviously because of second law of thermodynamics has to go into the ice so the question is what if all that energy that's being lost by the steam is absorbed by the ice is it possible for all of the steam to condense and for all of the ice to melt? Essentially, I'm trying to work out whether the final state of these materials are going to end up being in the middle where it's liquid water. It could be really trippy that I could give you a lot of ice. So let's say like 100 kilos or 500 kilos of ice and a tiny, incy, wincy little bit of steam. Um, and we know that it's entirely possible that the steam, as it drops down in temperature and really changes state from steam to water, and then from water dropping down in temperature until it's really, really cold, all that energy is being released. But it's possible that because I've got so much ice, that that energy being released actually can't melt all of it. Okay. Or in fact, it only melts some of it. Yeah. That's why this can be tricky. So the first thing to make sure is, is it possible to actually use all the steam turning into water, that energy to actually turn all the ice into water at zero degrees? So to check, I'm just going to compare the latent heat values. And so my latent heat um, Q equals to M S L V because it's a solid, um, L V being uh, sorry S is steam, L V is vaporization. So I'll just multiply that together. So my condensation value is forty five thousand uh, two hundred. So that's how much energy is coming out of the steam as it turns from steam 
back into liquid water. On the flip side of that, I've got ice that's turning from um, ice into liquid water. So how much energy does it take to put in energy to turn ice into water? I've done the calculation there for melting. As you can see, it's 0 0.100 times the latent heat of fusion for ice. And I work out that, yeah, I only need 33,300. So in terms of mathematics, the amount of heat that's coming out of the steam is more than enough to actually melt all the ice to turn it into zero degrees water, which is great, which means that I can now solve this problem because now I know that everything ends up somewhere in the middle between zero and 100 degrees. So to solve the problem, I simply start off doing the same thing, which is uh, Q gained equals to Q lost. So that means on the gain side, I've got ice turning into water. That's a latent heat. I've also got water at zero degrees going up to a uh, final temperature which is the specific capacity part of the problem and then on the other side where I've got energy being lost I need the steam to turn into water first so actually giving me the specific capacity calculation MSLV and then on the other side I actually need the water that is now at 100 degrees to come down to a thermal uh, final thermal equilibrium or final temperature that's consistent with where the water that came from ice got to. So that's my calculation there. The rest of this is just substitution. Let me zoom out so you can see all of it. And it's just pretty much substituting everything in, making sure that you have got your distributive law right. So making sure that things outside the bracket goes into both of the terms inside the bracket. On the left-hand side, one of the brackets uh, inside the bracket was a zero, so that doesn't matter. Um, on the right-hand side, it gets, it's a little bit tricky over there. But you should get the answer of about 40.27 recurring degrees. Once you get that, um, you need to be aware that uh, I've changed this to two significant figures because in the question itself, um, I only ever had two significant figures as the smallest amount of significant figure that I have, which is at 0, 0.0 degrees. Um, those are, both of those are significant. So if I've got those, then um, to represent 40.27 uh, uh, recurring in two significant figures, I need to change it into scientific notation. I get around that by doing this. I hope this helps you because your homework tonight is actually having a go at questions one to four, okay, right here on page six. Um, these are easy questions of specific heat and latent heat capacity problems. If you would like to challenge yourself, um, I'm happy also if you would like to start from the bottom up and do the bottom seven problems, which is question seven, six, five, four. Um, just be aware that question seven is like super duper A plus standard. So be ready for that. All right. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you tomorrow with all your homework done.